Well, grab your glasses and yank up your pants to an Urkel height. I'm Glasses Geek and I'm back again. So this is part two of the history of Wicca, and I'll be inserting a bit more jokes here and there, so don't be offended, please. And especially since this video is going to be so low on information, unfortunately. So, and, and also, um, I, I have my script in front of me, and I have it as level as I can have it with the camera, so if I keep on looking down or away from the camera, I'm sorry, it's just I'm reading my script. So, and I... I did a lot of research and I'm just going to read it. So basically this is going to be another talking head video, more or less. So there you go. So let's get into it. So this week and year I'm geeking out about Wicca and I'm trying to teach myself everything there is to know about the religion, everything I've managed to gather together, which I'll be presenting to, to, to you all here to all of y'alls, <laughs> sorry, which I'll be presenting to all of y'alls here. That sounds really wrong. Maybe presenting to everyone here. I don't know. Anyway. So to get back into it, the origins of the word Wicca, where did the word Wicca itself come from? And this is interesting what I managed to dig up. Um, supposedly, one night on September 1939, Gardner, a man mentioned in the previous video, you know, he's supposedly the father of Wicca, he was taken to a large house on high, in High Cliff, England, owned by a wealthy local woman named, quote, Old Dorothy Clutterbuck, unquote, where he was made to strip naked and taken through an initiation ceremony of some kind. Halfway through the ceremony, he heard the word Wicca, and he recognized it as an old English word for witch. Initially, Gardner wrote the word without the extra C in it, spelling it W-I-C-A. As it turns out, it's derived from Old Scots English, in other words, Scottish English, and it meant wise people. Gardner originally never referred to any of this new religion that he created as Wicca. In fact, he usually called it something that I prefer. He called it the craft of the wise, along with many other terms and titles. The modern term Wicca is derived from the old Anglo-Saxon English words. Wicca, W-I-C-C-A, Wicca, for the masculine, and uh, for the masculine witch and wiki, W-I-C-C-E, for female witch. So what was Wicca, or how did it all start? Well, it started initially as a movement, even an occult, or arguably a religion of sorts. It's been written from many different viewpoints, so it's kind of hard to tell exactly. But as far as I could find, it looked more like groups of people gathering who primarily had the same interests, really. And there was no real title for any of these groups. Though somewhere along the way, Gardner decided to start a group of his own, where only a goddess, a female, a woman, a lady, a goddess, would be worshipped. And everything done in the group would be centered around this one lady. So initially, there was no male and female gods or deities as there are today. There was only one female deity or goddess. The interesting thing about Gardner's group was that most, if not all, gatherings were done in the nude and there was scourging. So yes, in other words, there was nude whipping. Yep, ritual nude whipping. Not my cup of tea, I'll tell you that. The nudity, at least, was, according to him, to help connect people to their spiritual side and also to remove any status between the members. Now, I don't know if this was original to Gardner's group specifically or if this was a common thing for all of those, 
you know, these occult gatherings back in those days. I wouldn't be surprised if most occult gatherings continue like that today. But anyway, so Gardner claimed to have gotten his information from his past readings, searchings, and I'm sure channelings. And he claimed that the information that he had was all extremely ancient oral traditions that were unbroken and had been passed down from, be from before the advent of Christianity. Eventually, uh, someone, and somewhere along the line, someone convinced Gardner to write down his practices and what will be known as his creed or beliefs for this new religion. They also got him to finally, finally record what is, in part, still followed today, the actual actions for each group. You know, like, okay, so when everybody gathers, what are we going to do? You know, what's the, what's the itinerary? You know, like in church, you have, you know, first... Usually everybody says welcome and then there's singing and then there's preaching and then there's, you know, who knows, the donuts and the coffee afterward. Well, this is the same thing. You know, it's like, well, what are we going to do? And someone actually got him to write it down. So that's good. So coming into the recent past, how in the world did an eclectic and hidden religion, if you want to call it that, come over to the U.S. and explode so massively. And the only reason I, I loosely use the word religion is because, according to my understanding and from what I've researched, a lot of these occult gatherings, they don't consider themselves religion, and they don't want to be considered a religion. They literally consider themselves something else entirely. Why? I don't know. Because if you're a religion, not only do you get tax breaks, at least in this country, but you're actually heightened to a much better level than you would be if you weren't a religion. But I don't know. A lot of the things that I've read, they don't want to be called a religion. So that's why I'm trying to use the term religion loosely here. Because at this point in time, they weren't considering themselves a religion. It was still kind of just a gathering of people. And they were just doing their own thing. So anyway, so coming into the recent past, how in the world did an, did an eclectic and hidden religion come over to the U.S. and explode so massively? Well, from, from November 1947 to March 1948, Gardner and his wife toured the United States visiting, visiting relatives in Memphis, which is interesting. I didn't know he had relatives in Memphis. And he also visited New Orleans, where Gardner hoped to learn about voodoo, because he was into all things spiritual, I'm finding out. He's a bit like me. So it very much could have spread over to here, you know, during that time, during that, you know, time period, that time point. Also, in 1952, a woman named Doreen Valentini, or Valentin, I'm so sorry. I'll look it up. Give me a second. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. I have the pronunciation now, and I apologize ahead of time if I end up totally ruining it. So please forgive me ahead of time. But anyway, here we go. In 1952, a, a woman named Doreen Valiente met Gardner and joined his group, but by 1957, she had split from his coven, or his group of people that he had made, or got together. And it's interesting, from what I've found, it was, it's almost like this Doreen Valiente, it's like she managed to, and I'm sorry if I ruined her name again, it's like she managed to, uh, she was the catal catalyst. She seemed to be the only one that had the guts in the group to say, screw it, I'm out of here. I'm going off doing my own thing. And that is because it's right around this time that Gardner's group, the whole group split up with all of the members. Basically, it looked like every last member, except for maybe just a few, uh, they all went off. They all did their own thing. They completely broke off the group uh, with the nudity and the whipping. I'm not surprised. I would go off and do my own thing, too. I'm just saying, but, uh, sorry, but so many of the members, you know, they all went off and they all formed their own groups. They all formed what we, what, what we would call today their own covens. 
So this seems, this very much seems like when things were suddenly starting to unravel when it come, when it came to keeping stuff silent, you know, keep it secret, keep it safe, keep it silent, you know, don't let anyone know. And this very much seems to be when things were suddenly starting to unravel when it came to keeping stuff under their hats and keeping it silent and secret and hidden. So, and it, uh, and it appears that this is when the beginning of Wicca as we know it today began to form because once that group was broken, suddenly it's like the lid was off the pot or the cat was out of the bag and, uh, you know, there you go. Next thing you know, they they feel more free to actually let people know that, hey, I have gatherings and it's actually helping me out spiritually or emotionally or whatever. And, you know, you end up drawing in brand new people, new members, so. So when it comes to the religion coming over to the U.S., okay, if... If you want any kind of official names or dates, then I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't able to find any. The more I tried to get, the more info I tried to get about this religion from the more recent past, the less I was able to find. I was able to find tons of stuff for, you know, World War I, World War II. I was able, mainly around the time of World War II, and Hitler and the Nazis and all that. I was able to find a lot of info around that period of time and after it. But the second the 1960s hit, it started to peter off to the point where there was almost nothing in the 1970s. And I couldn't find anything for the 80s virtually. Nothing. So it was really unfortunate. I don't know if it's because uh, it's almost like science. You know, you're just not going to get that much information recently because there just isn't anything. Because it's just so eclectic. It's everywhere. Uh, kind of like science, or if it's, or if people are still keeping it hidden today. But what I do have, and that includes any of this stuff coming over to the U.S. I don't know if it's because I'm living in the U.S. and therefore I'm not able to find stuff about how this came to be in the U.S. or you know if I have to be an English person person researching from England or. A Canadian person researching from Canada to be able to get any info about how this stuff came over to the US I don't know you know but what I did find and if you want any kind of official names or dates then the best I have is an Englishman who recently back in those days uh, I think it was in the 1960s or so who had recently immigrated to the US his name was Raymond Buckland and his wife, Rosemary. And they seem, these two people seem to be the main people who brought this new religion and way of believing and thinking over to the U.S., at least officially. Now, I'm on the outside. I'm not in any groups. I'm not in any covens. I'm not in, I'm not involved in any of this. So this is entirely layman's researching layman's information and this is what I was able to get my hands on maybe if I was involved in some group or who knows what uh, I would be able to get my hands on far better information but this is what I was able to attain and so whether or not this Raymond Buckland and his wife Rosemary are actually the people that brought it over I don't know uh, because in all honesty, this whole religion seems to be more of what is known as folk magic or homegrown type of what is known today as superstitions uh, and belief systems, which have been around since the beginning of human beings. So more than likely, what this type of thing, at least in the form of, you know, superstition, witchcraft, workings and whatnot, if, if you will... Uh, it was all around long before anyone is recorded as bringing it over to America. So if you really are looking for dates and places and names, then then it just it doesn't really exist. Everyone brought their own religions over just as they do in every country. Everyone brought their own way of living over. Everyone brought their own households over. Everyone brought, you know, just who and what they were and their families over and everything. So it's really going to be just a mishmash, a true melting pot. 
but if you are looking for dates and places and names, then Raymond Buckland and his wife Rosemary are definitely a place to start. And I'm sorry if I'm mutilating his name, but it, I'm just reading it, you know, English-wise. You know, American English-wise. So, anyway. So, this, uh, this Raymond Buckland, he was working for British Airways. And he actually, you know, he actually moved over to America proper. He got his American citizenship. But he would, because he worked for British Airways, he would spend a lot of his time over in England. And so when he would return to England, he would end up corresponding with Gardner. So, and apparently visiting him off and on. And so, yeah, that's about it. Unfortunately, I'm unable to find any kind of real information at all for when the religion of Wicca uh, itself uh, and the way of thinking that it has that I've managed to find so far uh, might have spread to this country and if it if if it actually originated outside this country. So at least in the line of this country, uh, currently I'm being slightly stonewalled and, or blocked entirely. Uh, other than what I've presented here, I was unable to find any more of, well, anything, anywhere. So, and, and I don't know why. So that's that for that. <laughs> the other information that I do have is that Wicca more or less officially was brought over in the late 50s and early 60s, where it took hold and spread. Or at least, you know, brought over to America. I'm, I'm talking about America now because that's where I am. But... Now, I'm constantly given this general time period, the 50s and the 60s, mainly the 60s, but with no substance behind it, which is very annoying to me because I'm OCD and I'm also, I, I'm Asperger's and I just, I need, <laughs> I need definite, you know, definite stuff. Anyway. Although I, I learned in the past in my early 20s how to accept gray areas and I'm learning again to the best of my abilities how to accept gray areas in research such as this and this is this is a little tough for me and and I'm learning how to accept gray areas and no definite definitions for anything in the line of life too which is very difficult for me I, I hate having to be in limbo but you know it's it's fine as all I care if I got more freedom in limbo, I'll take the more freedom and I'll take the limbo. So anyway, and as for people, uh, so, so back to the Wiccan thing, sorry. <laughs> so as for Wicca coming over here to the United States, there's no substance behind it at all. As for why or when or how it came over in the fifties and the sixties, there really isn't anything. It's just stated, well, it came over in the sixties. Well, it came over in the fifties they don't give any information to back that up. It's very annoying, but it, it's repeated over and over again. So it's like, all right. I'm thinking that it's the 60s when it really caught wind and it became popular over here, especially for people who are, who are outcasts. So I'm thinking that that's why it's, it's seen as the 60s is when it really came over to the United States. I don't know if that's the truth, but that's the feeling that I get very strongly. But uh, there's... There's nothing to back any of this up. So anyway, and as for people, well, again, as I said before, I'm being stonewalled. And as an overall, as for Wicca coming over to America, well, America is so incredibly large that in its own way, it's very much like many very independent countries all labeled under one umbrella. This can be especially proven merely with the huge diversity in accents. You may have complete, you, you have to have complete cutoff from one area to another to the point where you don't even have the same verbal communication with another area to have such starkly different accents emerge. This, and, and just to let you know, 
And I actually read that out of a professor's book in college. So I was kind of surprised about that, how you can keep the same language, but a totally different accent. And the accents in this country are so, so massive and diverse that you can take someone who was, I think my mom said, there was this lady in church, she, she was the, she was the mother of the pastor and she said that she had a South Carolina accent. But if you, you can take accents that are so incredibly different that you can't understand the words that they were using. And that's what happened to me when I first came down South here. I couldn't understand a single word. The words that they used and the way, mainly the way that they pronounced them, I couldn't understand what a single person was saying. I just couldn't. So... And because of living down here my whole life, my northern Minnesotan accent, it's still there, but it has been taken away, essentially, to the point where I now have a TV accent, where I don't really have that Minnesotan thing. You can still hear the accents here and there in some of the words and in some of the uh, syllables and whatnot that I say, in some of the letters, the way I say the letters in the word. But... Um, you know, it's, it's been tamped down to the point where I sound like I'm someone on TV. So there you go for TV accents. If you're trying to get rid of an accent, it's, it's like the Northern without the Northern, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you took the North out of the Northerner, you know, so that's kind of what it is I've found. So at least, at least according to my ear. So I don't know. But, uh, so yeah, just as an example, this can be most heard in, say, a Southern accent versus a Minnesotan accent, like mine, versus the most stark accent of all in this country, something that is literally basically a whole other language, really, the Louisiana accent or the Bayou or Cajun accent. Now, supposedly these people, they speak English. They really, they do. They speak English. They speak American English. But it's usually with a mix of French and other words that are unique. And I mean, truly unique to that area. And the, and the way that they pronounce the American English is so different. And you really have to get into the areas of you know, the bayou and the Cajun area. But if you go down to the bayou and if you go down to the Cajun area, they, they do, they will have their own Eng their own language. It's, it's unique to that area. But if you get outside of it just a little bit, the people will be speaking English, but the accent will be so stark that you might not be able to understand what they're saying. And these are the people, they call them backwoods, they call them rednecks, they call them southerners, whatever you want to, call it they uh they, these are the people who who really haven't traveled outside their area kind of like the boston accent the boston accent it is so stark you know that th it's literally called the boston accent that's another good example the boston accent you know and there's many accents like that all across america so that just that goes to show that america is literally like and each state in America even is, they have their own areas like Boston, you know, where each area in each state is so much like its own independent country and its own independent world even, that it's kind of shocking that, you know, anyone can get along, <laughs> anyone can understand each other, that you can actually have such excellent shipping and communication against all, you know, through all these areas, especially in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and just, so when it comes to something new, coming over to such a huge and diverse landscape, such as America, where each state literally acts according according to our constitution as their own independent country pretty much and and they're supposed to get along with each other despite everything and then you have each county in each state acting as its own independent almost you know world as you can see with the accents themselves you know just and it's such a huge and diverse landscape where the people are, or at least were, truly cut off from each other in each area, then you can very much expect things such as, 
this religion of Wicca and any type of anything, when it comes over here, it's going to be so twisted and morphed. It's, it's going to be twisted quite a bit and morphed quite a bit. And so, and... And so just because a bit of information gets to one area, that does not mean it'll reach another area. And what bits of information reach and where they reach is a real toss up, along with how each bit of information is interpreted. So, you know, what is believed in one area is very much not believed in another. And what is popular in one area, in one area doesn't even exist in another. And this is true even down to counties and from town to town. So just because the people think that something is cool does not mean that in the very next county over, people will think the same thing. And you got to realize that back in the 1950s and 60s, this was compounded by being cut off from any kind of real or instantaneous communication back in the day. In the 50s and 60s, I mean, there were plenty of people who didn't even have telephones because they were just too poor. Uh, I, I actually back in, in the year 2000, in the 2000s, you know, way before 2010, far before, I actually dated someone who in his childhood, he had an outhouse. So if in the year 2000, you know, you can, the, I mean, I know of people today on, uh, you know, where the Native Americans live, you know, back, you know, out on, you know, tribal land where they have outhouses, they don't have flushing toilets. So if, if you're so poor that you don't even have a flushing toilet, you're not going to have phones. And back in the fifties and sixties, there was tons of poor people that didn't even have a phone. And so if you don't have a phone, which is an instantaneous form of communication, you're very much not going to have a television. And a television, you know, and the most that a lot of people had, especially when I moved down south down here, everybody had a radio. That was their main form of mass communication. Not everybody had a TV when I moved down here or was moved down here in 1990, the year 1990 proper. So that says everything. And back in the day, these were the fastest means of communication. Television was mass communication, instantaneous mass communication. The next best thing after that is radio. Radio was instant means of mass communication. After that, there's instant communication via a telephone. The only other thing other than that, that was really reliable that everyone would have would be sitting down and writing out by hand a letter. So when you have people cut off from each other like that, and you have something such as Wicca spread over here, what I said earlier really is true. You know, I mean, who knows what bits of information will reach to who and where they will reach. And then depending upon how the people are thinking in that region and thinking at that point in time, who knows how that information is even going to be interpreted. So yeah. So for Wicca to spread anywhere is quite a fascination, especially in the ages of the 1950s and the 1960s and in each area who knows what kind of information and how much would have been able to trickle down to people you know and out to people and then of course how it would have been interpreted so it was base so it was because of this that caused wicca to change so drastically and for it to be turned into something else entirely so according to my research and what I learned, it started out in England as kind of an occult and it actually started out as witchcraft proper, but then it hit the shores of the U.S. and it spread throughout this mishmash and menagerie of this just, just, I'll say crap show of disconnected people, miscommunication, and just essentially just 
you know, basically individual countries united under one umbrella, one roof, one name, and one mass uh, currency, uh, you know, the U.S. and the U.S. dollar. And, you know, and what little bits of television and radio were getting out to little areas, I mean... So if you can understand that at all, this is the information that I've dug up. So so by the time it finally managed to reach all the way to the West Coast in California, you could very much say it had been through the entire bowel system of that is the U.S. or of the U.S. And by that point, by the time it hit California and actually took off and became really popular, to spread, you know, kind of like hitting a sound wall and bouncing like sound waves back across the rest of the U.S., which is now what's happening in this era. It's just, you know, it by the time it reached the West Coast and started echoing out, it had changed radically. I mean, completely radically. <laughs> so not turning it into crap, let's say, but just turning it into something completely removed from what it originally was, which, according to my searchings, uh, was occultism and witchcraft proper. And, you know, people who believed in the occult and witchcraft and practicing the occult and witchcraft. So, you know, so that... By the 1970s and the 1980s, when it gained a good foothold and even arguably popularity in California proper, it also got a huge influx of feminist, gay, and ecological activism and feminist people, gay people, and ecological activism people. And they infused into it you know, all of their beliefs and all of their stuff and all of their feminism and all of their gayness and all of their ecological activism and all of their, you know, stuff. And so they actually took it and changed it even further, creating it into the religion that we more recognize today. Oh, I'm going to need to take a break after this. <laughs> So today, what is Wicca today? So that is the question. So yeah, what is Wicca today? I think I'll be dealing more with that uh, in other subsequent videos after this. But in, in, in an attempt to really sum it up here and pu to put it succinctly, uh, fact to sum it up in the you could almost call it one word. I don't know what else to call it. I have an entire couple of paragraphs here. But um, so yeah, today, what is Wicca today? Uh, today, it is an actual and true religion. And it focuses, or at least it seems to focus mainly on nature. And it is divided into three branches. There's the uh, gardener Wicca or the Gardinian Wicca, <laughs> uh, which claims direct lineage to, you know, Gardner and his followers and his original practices, and they follow all of his original practices more closely. Uh, there's membership in where only certain people are allowed to join. So that's, that's more of like a group-based kind of Wicca where groups of people uh, get together and usually it's restricted to only, certain, to only a certain number of people. And, you know, you have, you know, and they can even restrict it further so that it's only a group of women or a group of gay men or straight men or what have you, you know, or whatever. So there's, there's membership Wicca where it's groups of people, and then there's theological orientations, and they they have their own agendas and constraints, and they conform to certain beliefs and whatnot. So that's... I guess that's a way to sum it up. But then there's the individual uh, believers, practitioners, what have you, and they... 
they practice independently uh, and they believe independently and they go down their own independent path, which I think the majority of people are nowadays. And I just, personally, I like that myself, especially in all this learning. But uh, really, I, I don't know what to call myself. I'm just a spiritualist currently. And I'm, I'm getting a lot of joy out of researching this. <laughs> Even though I'm not finding much to my satisfaction, I, I am getting a lot of joy out of it. So. so in the end, to sum it all up, at least officially speaking, uh, to sum all of this up, uh, the last video, last week's video and this week's video, Basically, it all started in England, and then it spread to the U.S. in the 1960s, where it exploded and morphed into many other, arguably, religions. Uh, and all these religions are, you could nearly say that they're completely independent of each other, yet they still function under the same title, the title of Wicca. Uh... This is kind of like how Catholics are so not evangelicals and United Unitarians are not either of these, yet they all are considered Christians and they all work under that title, the title, at least in the U.S., of Christianity. And I suspect they do this so that they won't be taxed, at least in the U.S., but all of these denominations have churches and they're all considered and they're all considered Christian churches uh, at that. But if you compare any of these to each other, you'll find that they very much are not the same religion. At least it seems like that. And yet somehow they are all categorized as such. And they themselves take the title of Christian. And they're gathering places as churches. So... They're, they all consider themselves Christian churches. And the same can be said for the Wiccan religion. They also have many different denominations, or for them, uh, they call themselves sects, or sects, S-E-C-T-S. I can't pronounce it correctly, I'm sorry. Uh, but they all have different denominations or sects, uh, which are very independent of each other. And on top of this, like any religion, there are obviously many people who are very much deeply into the religion and others who are more like Wiccan light. You know, there's lots of people who are heavy into Christianity and then there's people who never go to church except for like on the holidays. So it's, it's the same thing in this Wicca religion, it seems. Uh, just as it is in any religion. And... It seems that just as in any religion, there's lots of, it's, it looks like infighting between uh, the sects of these relig, you know, these Wiccan denominations, whatever you want to call them. Um, there's different infighting. There's groups that say, you know, you're not a Wiccan if you believe this. And then there's other groups that say, well, you're not a Wiccan if you do this. And then there's other groups that say, well, you're not a Wiccan if you practice this or if you believe that. So just uh, as far as I know, it's looking very much like Christianity. If you consider yourself a Christian, then you're a Christian no matter what any church has told you. And if you consider yourself a Wiccan, then you are a Wiccan, no matter what anyone else has told you. I haven't found anyone, granted I'm new to this, and this is from a layman, I don't know, but uh, that's what I've found so far. So, sorry. Uh, so to get off that tangent and on to the next item, uh, I mentioned earlier how most gatherings were done in the nude and there was flogging going way back to that. Well, thankfully, as far as I can tell, for most groups, uh, the flogging went away immediately. And then with the advent and the donning of clothing, most realized that the notion of Gardner inheriting a set of unwritten oral traditions for Wiccan practices and rituals was doubted, to say the least. So everyone or most today know that Wicca actually began, or at least they consider it beginning, with Gardner and his associates. So for Wicca, it actually began with Gardner and his associates and the very ideas, you know, 
sprang forth from uh, from his mind and his uh, the other people who were practicing with them from their own minds. And so for Wicca today, what it is, Wicca today is no longer people practicing the occult or witches practicing magic or witchcraft, but instead it is a way to connect to nature and to worship and care for nature as it should be. And it's also for anyone who gathers in groups, it also seems to be a way for people to... Uh, to share what they believe and to gather with others who have the same beliefs or the same thoughts. And basically it seems to be a way for people to enjoy each other's company, literally, and enjoy the company of someone who thinks or believes like them. So and yeah, so Wicca today basically seems to be a way to connect to nature and to worship nature and to care for it as it should be and for people to connect with each other who believe the same way. And uh, and from the way I see it, uh, you know, it's good because if something does not have a voice to call out for it, then you must call out for it. And if you, and if something does not have the ability to help itself, then it's your job to help it. And so, or at least that's the way I believe and what I have to say. And Wicca seems to be that exactly. Granted, this is coming from a layman, someone who has done a lot of research into it, but I've just now researched it. I spent the last month or so researching it. And um, this is the info I've been able to dig up. So, and I cobbled as much as I could together in about one week. So writing this script took about I, I wrote several scripts at once, so it took about two weeks to do. And this script was a bear. And this, this script alone took about two weeks to do, and I had to chop it up into two scripts. So, so yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Coming over to America caused it to become a whole new religion. You know, a whole new religion to be birthed, if you want to call it that. Uh, one that separates itself from magic and witchcraft and focuses entirely on nature in all its forms and aspects. So, yeah, and that's that's really the best that I can sum it up there. Uh, I know that summing it up here really was an absolute mess. <laughs> and I know that, I know I threw that last bit in there at the end. Uh, yes, when it comes to current Wicca and witchcraft, there doesn't seem to be any more whipping or scourging. There doesn't seem to be any more nudity, thankfully, unless your group decides to practice that, in which case, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Um, and that's it for the history of Wicca that I have on my researchings and my searchings. And this has really worn me out, so I'm going to take a break. So yeah, so if you like this uh, and you want to keep watching more, please click the like button, please click, click the thumbs up button. Uh, definitely subscribe if you want to see more videos. Uh, click the notification button so that way you'll know when more videos come out. And that's it for me. Uh, I'll be back next week to geek out again. And thanks for stopping by the flip side of life. And I hope to have more out for you next week. And uh, I hope you have a great geeky week and a great, a great Wiccan geeky week. <laughs> and my love goes to you all. So nanu nanu, live long and prosper. And remember, laughter and happiness save lives. And as far as I'm concerned, look for the truth, search for the truth. And I hope that you manage to find the truth that soothes your soul. So, bye. Bye. <laughs>